interesting part of the uh, discussion around the PEP are the proposals that did not make it uh, into the final. Uh, you briefly alluded to those in the keynote address, but maybe a quick uh, round out on, on which were the ones that you felt more strongly about yourself and uh, you would wish uh, that maybe um, the next commission takes, uh, takes further. Uh, basically, uh, the main uh, issue uh, which we have with this uh, outcome of uh, PEP uh, negotiations is indeed the question on uh, portability of the PEPs. Uh, our initial proposal, European Commission's initial proposal, was much more uh, ambitious that basically uh, PEPs need to be provided across the EU. And now this uh, uh, basically portability has been limited that uh, uh, it's only need to be provided in one additional member state uh, uh, on top of uh, home uh, member state. And the concern with this is, of course, that uh, uh, with uh, this, uh, you are not getting true pan-European pensions product. You are getting maybe, I don't know, part European pensions product. And uh, uh, that it still will continue to be uh, active in those parts in Europe where uh, pensions products are already active, uh, where there are active national markets. And uh, this uh, benefit of spreading per PEP across the EU will not uh, materialize to the extent uh, which we have hoped. Uh, but it must be said that uh, I don't uh, even know how much next European Commission will be able uh, to do because the problem was not in the Commission, the problem was that there was no majority neither among member states nor in European Parliament. So for whatever reasons, uh, uh, this portability has been uh, very much restricted. It must be said that a number of established pension funds were also advocating against so uh, that's where we currently uh, are. Now, another point, uh, uh, probably uh, less critical from you know uh, 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 consumer or several point of view, is the uh, role of uh, EOPA in uh, uh, governing uh, PEPs. Uh, also, there, our initial proposal was uh, that since it's a pan-European uh, product, it's should be governed uh, to the larger extent by European institutions, meaning the EOPA in this case, and also there, uh, it was uh, the role of EOPA was uh, actually uh, left quite uh, limited. But uh, this, uh, I would say, uh, is part of the more classical discussion. We saw the same in uh, Europe, uh, review of European supervisory authorities that member states are not uh, necessarily in a hurry to give uh, more. Uh, uh, role to the European supervisory authorities. But, so the main point is that really those limits on, uh, on portability which have been uh, introduced. Will the implementation of the PEP2 uh, be forthcoming in the next two years, depending on the date of the adoption within the, uh, within the Council? Uh, how do you see this will be taken forward in Finland specifically? Do you see any particular changes in the governance uh, of pension funds, pension products that uh, this might trigger? There is the cap uh, that has been introduced, so uh, maybe how do, how do you see this trickling down in, in the case of Finland? We already have a, a huge amount of different uh, ways to save for, for old age, so I don't think it's a, it's a supply issue. Uh, to me, it's more like a demand issue. I, how to get how to get people to use these wonderful products that banks and insurance companies already offer. So uh, again, to me, not sure how much the industry can actually do beyond, of course, continue. But then again, the marketing by the banks is already there in terms of trying to get people to to, to realize the need. And then again, if I if I may, I mean, of course, in a welfare state like Finland, this is a fundamental issue in the sense that. Traditionally, uh, I mean, let, let's remember, we are spending uh, on a mandatory basis whatever 24% of our annual or monthly income is actually is actually taken to the occupational pension system. So as such, we are all <laughs> in the Nordics or in Finland. We, we are already, you know, saving for pension 24% of our monthly salary. So, so traditionally, it's been deemed that that's should be enough, the kind of, in a way, the commitment and promise from the state has traditionally been that, that hey, no, no worries, we take care of you. And also the kind of long-term, other long-term needs to say, say, school, schooling for your kids, I mean, in the Nordic, schooling is for free, you get sick, no worries, the state pays for it. So as such, we've been traditionally lacking 
a lot of the needs compared to, say, the US for uh, saving long term. So, of course, this, to me, fundamentally, the kind of this is a, also the pet discussion is, is all about the gradual potential need to, to change this kind of traditional way of seeing. And then we come to the funding gap. And, uh, and of course, in Finland, the situation is pretty good. I mean, our pension funds, I mean, the occupational pension, pension funds, they are pretty well funded today. And uh, they, they have been doing pretty well in terms of annual returns. But still, I'm looking at the aging population, the very low birth rate we have in Finland nowadays. And, and uh, so also as I see it, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm 46 now, uh, I'm not sure if in 20 years when I retire, I'm not sure if the system as it stands today will actually deliver me a pension without, because I'm in the younger generation. I don't think, or let's put it this way, I think there is a limit to how much folks are willing to actually uh, hand out from their annual salary to a pension system, especially if the pension if, if the pension promised to you personally, then it starts to be on a shaky crowd. So, 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 so it turns into a uh, pretty kind of fundamental political question. Sorry for the long answer. And again, tremendous thanks to Mr. Dombrovskis for agreeing to, to take this, uh, this early in the adoption process. Um, that uh, it will indeed, the implementation of the PEP will throw up some of these questions. And uh, I believe in, um, in uh, some of the countries, like Lithuania, has already uh, thrown up these questions uh, last year. So I would like to follow uh, up with a question to but it is uh, about the change, uh, the changes that were introduced last year in the uh, Lithuanian pensions uh, system, and then maybe talking through gradually on uh, what further need for change uh, would uh, this this product uh, lead to. I'm glad to uh, be invited in this conference. So thank you very much. Uh, so moving to uh, Lithuanian pension system. So. Uh, it was uh, a reform uh, last year, and uh, still it's uh, it's continuing uh, for upcoming uh, three months. It's it's a transition period. Uh, so I, I would divide uh, Lithuanian pension system reform into two uh, different parts. Uh, so the first was uh, the first uh, is a tax reform that uh, separates uh, savings from uh, redist uh, redistribution. Uh, and then the second part uh, was impacted uh, uh, directly uh, pension funds and so how they uh, operate. Uh, so the biggest change uh, was implemented uh, life cycle funds uh, because it was a problem in Lithuania uh, that uh, too much people, too much young people uh, were investing and were saving for their long term goals. Uh, in fixed income products, in, in bonds, as uh, Mr. Guzman uh, mentioned, and uh, uh, some uh, older people uh, before their retirement uh, were staying in equity uh, funds. Uh, that is a huge risk. Uh, so that's why uh, life cycle funds uh, were implemented in Lithuania. And uh, I'm glad that uh, this reform uh, happened because uh, currently uh, the, the percentage of investments into equity uh, after this reform uh, would be uh, would go up to uh, 80 or even 90 percent, uh, and that uh, that's an ability to uh, to save uh, much more money compared to fixed income product. So maybe Latvia should uh, should also consider about uh, about such kind of reform or such kind of incentive because until last year or just two years ago it was uh, uh, the, the uh, most risky fund uh, was uh, was 50-50, uh, 50, 50, 50 equity, 50 uh, fixed income but still uh, too uh, many people are saving their uh, money in, uh, in fixed income products. So probably that's uh, the, the biggest changes uh, in, in tax reform and in pension system and everything. Um, any particular changes to the governance of the pension funds? Um, I, would, I think that, uh, of course, uh, governance uh, might uh, always be better. Uh, but uh, we are lucky that uh, during uh, 15 years uh, period uh, since uh, second pillar of pension fund reform was implemented, there were no scandal, no nothing. Uh, 
and no, nothing serious related to, to governance in, in pension funds because uh, it is highly, highly regulated. Uh, every pension fund or almost every fund, even mutual fund, it has to have uh, a custody. So that's why it is uh, assets separated from uh, from investment management side. Uh, so I, I think that governance uh, level is uh, is really high uh, in Lithuania and moving to Latvia side, if, if I can so that's say. That's what your role, right? You're the chief investment officer across. <laughs> yes. So. Uh, it's uh, absolutely natural, not, not just in Lithuania, but in, in, in the rest in, in, in the world, to have uh, benchmarks for, for funds. Uh, so it's, it's really interesting why uh, in Latvia it's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not happening. Uh, so it, it, it would be uh, much easier for, uh, for uh, future pensioners or for, for people uh, that would like to, uh, to choose a different pension fund just to, to see uh, the benchmark that represent, uh, represents a strategy and how it is implemented. Uh, because the, the, the difference between uh, a benchmark and, and actual results uh, demonstrate maybe uh, the wrong implementation or as also Mr. Guzman uh, mentioned that uh, it's, it's too much uh, cost inside the fund. Mm -hmm. So that's um, a really important thing that might easily implement it in, in Latvia. To improve uh, government. Okay. Before we move to the Latvian proposals, uh, to Christina, I wanted to follow up with a question to Mr. Dombrovskis uh, to maybe take up uh, the thoughts that Mr. Husman and Mr. Uh, Rukas uh, raised. Uh, one is on, on this broader discussion on the first pillar pensions and the, and the private pensions and the role of, in some countries of occupational pensions which are nearly non-existent here uh, when it comes to Latvia. I think they're uh, similarly underdeveloped in, uh, in the three Baltic uh, countries uh, historically. Uh, and then the other side on the, uh, on the governance and the, and the cost structure um, that has been now capped in the, in the puppet uh, at 1%, maybe some of the details around those discussions that you encountered through the adoption. Um, well, uh, first, uh, as regards uh, the first um, uh, pension uh, level, well, probably I would not be as uh, 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 pessimistic. Uh, we uh, still will have uh, state uh, pensions, uh, but of course, uh, adequacy of state pensions will be a challenge. That's uh, clearly with population aging, and I was mentioning those uh, ratios if we currently have. Uh, 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 one pensioner for four working age people by 2050 will have one to two. Of course, we understand that this uh, challenge is going to be very uh, serious. And that's why we are um, uh, diversifying our pension system. That's why we have uh, first pillar. That's why we are introducing second pillar. And I would say uh, returns in the second pillar would be probably subject to a separate discussion. I think there's also some scope for improvement. Uh, and um, that's why I'm discussing uh, a third pillar, so voluntary personal uh, uh, pensions. And we will need a combination of so, uh, all three uh, the, to deal with the challenges posed by population aging. Uh, then on uh, uh, costs of uh, personal uh, pensions, that's in indeed uh, one of the uh, reasons why uh, personal pensions are maybe less attractive to uh, savers, which is often quite high uh, and untransparent fees. But lots of, so to say, uh, uh, income uh, which uh, could be uh, generated as a result of those savings is then uh, taken, uh, <laughs> taken away uh, through uh, fees. That's why we are introducing uh, this uh, cap on 1% of the annual capital population uh, for uh, uh, fees. Uh, and uh, we think that the scaling up to the, uh, 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 across uh, EU, so above only national uh, markets would allow to reduce also uh, the fees because also providers would be able to benefit from the economies of scale. And that's where probably this incentive of uh, using a PEP uh, label 
uh, there would be incentive to actually advertise it uh, broader than in just uh, two member states, which is a bare minimum right now, uh, uh, to capture broader market and uh, to actually help those uh, economies of scale. So that uh, we hope is at least an inbuilt incentive, which will still compensate partly from weaker uh, provisions in the regulation on the portability itself. Thank you, thank you. So as we grapple with these uh, questions here in, in Latvia, I want to uh, pass the floor now to Ms. Lomanovska uh, to talk us through the, the proposals that we've been considering, both for the second pillar but also for the third. And maybe a way, a bit of a uh, intro into that is that we really see PEP providing a, a framework to structure the debate on some of the proposals around the second pillar that we've, uh, that we've been trying to, uh, to put forward. And I think that the finance Latvia definitely support the liberalization of the market and, and the bigger competition scenery, putting in a third pillar like voluntary pension savings, uh, several players and only pension funds, uh, life companies, also investment, asset management companies. I mean, the, the more players they are, the, the better it is for uh, for the industry and for every customer. And um, the, the, the same efficiency comes in and, and the same um, uh, the pricing uh, pricing decrease and, and through that I think that we fully fully support it and uh, the question is only how to how to implement it in practice and, and there are some questions are, are might arise and it will be an interesting process uh, uh, I think that yes industry to some extent is is ready for that uh, because if we analyze our product and uh, is adding uh, couple of features, we are pretty much there. I mean, the, the sub-accounts are maybe for each country is, is uh, one particular thing to be implemented, but otherwise uh, um, pretty much um, products are correspondent to that, but then the question is on those small features on the portability and uh, how practically to do it and then what it will mean in practice. Uh, on top of that, also the issue that Mr. Dombrowski touched is how it will be supervised. Now, will we have to license one, once more or, or how, how it will be in practice? But I think it's um, kind of an iterative process and I think that the framework or the idea that is uh, postulated by PEP is very good and we, we just have to go in this iterative process. That, of, of course, um, Mr. Tugnosis is slightly upset that there's only one member state, but maybe let's start with one and then see how it works. If we will manage one member state, then most probably we will manage the others as well. So let, let's give it a try in that sense. Uh, but coming back to our proposals from the Finance Latvia, we have worked quite hard over the last year and there has been quite a lot of changes in the legislation regarding the second pension pillar. And a lot has been done already last year, both in terms of the decreasing the fee levels, which has been decreased considerably to all this uh, already kind of a famous 1%, it's, uh, it's already uh, with year to year going closer to 0.4% already uh, in second pension pillar and also about the benchmarks, they are actually the benchmarks, the, the one thing that I noted for myself is maybe we have to make it more visible in our uh, website, uh, Manapensi.lv, which uh, we think to improve also over this year on the visibil visibility side and, and I think that's a good idea to to make also the benchmark visible there. So there has been a lot of good things done over the last year and, um, and also allowing uh, to increase the investments in more equity uh, going up to 75% in a maximum. However, we see that there are some uh, still future potential improvements and one of the big issues is about um, whether we should take more risk when we are young and start uh, start participating in second pension pillar or we should be rather modest and I think that's a big debate that Mr. Alex was also addressing that we have to be cautious here. Uh, I agree with that but uh, yes it's um, uh, there, there are crises uh, and, and financial turbulence is now and then every 10 years and, and we have to survive all of them. And of course, uh, this Lithuanian approach of life cycle is not a panacea itself. I, I mean, uh, if, you, if you go for the first 30 years in equity stake, it means that you have the same turbulences and the society has to be ready to the uh, ups and downs, I mean also to the minuses. But I think that this debate is, is very important because otherwise, if we don't allow and uh, don't kind of promote uh, going into more equities, then demanding from the asset managers to get uh, 
a, a, a higher return is like tying their hands and, and their feet and, and, and asking them to swim. I mean, you, you can't squeeze out uh, higher yields if you go only for a, for a fixed income investment. That's, that's quite obvious. So I think that this debate is in place and we have several, uh, several proposals which uh, there is no one silver bullet unfortunately, but, uh, but there are some ways out of how we gradually could, uh, could uh, move to the higher uh, equity stakes in the investment uh, area in the second pension pillar and through that also to higher yield. Maybe we can take, uh, take up this life cycles discussion. So, uh, Luciania has just introduced, I uh, believe that some of the discussion is also taking place in Estonia. Uh, in fact, as part of the government formation process, uh, it's part of the PEP. Um, maybe we could ask both Mr. Dombrovskis and Mr. Husman to reflect on the life cycle approaches uh, and, uh, and uh, how, how these have been introduced and whether there is a reason for us to be as uh, cautious as we are here because today the life cycle approach uh, and the whether the third um, uh, second pillar and, and uh, the third pillar of course uh, a bit easier but it's not a dominant part of the discussion while the yield part is uh, and the question is where do you get the yield from uh, well exactly that's um, uh, the point uh, here is that uh, to, to get the, uh, the yield you also need to move into uh, equity and if you look in our uh, PEP uh, proposal uh, uh, there is a uh, possibility for pre -pro pre -pro uh, providers to uh, invest in equity, including uh, in equity uh, which is not listed, including in uh, equity uh, which is, uh, uh, so to say, listed in uh, currencies other than uh, national uh, uh, currencies. Uh, there is uh, possibilities to invest in uh, uh, infrastructure projects, in real estate, uh, because the idea is uh, that it's a long-term uh, uh, investment in the case, so uh, it has to be a patient investment. Of course, there are uh, prudential limits to all of this, because uh, uh, at the end of the day, we are talking about pensions uh, product here, so a pensions product uh, by its nature has to be quite uh, conservative. Uh, of course, a uh, payment provider can uh, come with, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, up to six different uh, options in uh, PEP. The basic option has to be the most uh, conservative, uh, aiming at at least uh, uh, preserving the uh, capital without enforcing a strict capital guarantee of providers because uh, for uh, legal reasons it would make uh, PEP uh, uh, substantially more expensive uh, product, but the basic aim of the basic option is, uh, 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 so to say, maintaining the capital, and then you can move in, so to say, relatively more aggressive options. So these uh, possibilities are there provided by uh, PEP, and we understand that uh, to have adequate yields, you need to have some uh, scope uh, for maneuver, and also in terms of uh, by providers, it can be asset managers, it can be traditionally uh, insurers, and therefore there is also flexibility how you uh, can uh, take out PEP, uh, so to say, whether it's annuity or uh, lump sum, so there is also some uh, flexibility there. Right, <coughs> so on the, uh, on the Finland side, uh, first on the occupational second pillar system, uh, it's still, to me, too limited uh, how much the uh, Finnish occupational insurance funds can actually invest in, uh, in, in, in equities. Uh, it has been relaxed over the last 10 years. I think the financial crisis, uh, a little bit uh, paradoxically, actually uh, woke people up on the need to actually, if any assets are long term, then pension assets, i.e. the financial crisis with the share prices taking a big hit. Uh, both people have to, to realize that uh, too strict kind of uh, uh, limitations on the kind of uh, capital buffers of pension funds can actually result in, in the opposite of what's aimed at, i.e. worst case is that pension funds need to sell equities exactly <laughs> when you shouldn't sell. And, and that was actually dealt with, with some, I would call it even emergency uh, legislation in Finland back in 2009. To, to prevent the pension funds from having to actually sell when the, when the markets were, were down. Um, and since then, it's, it's now better, but, uh, but to me, I mean, I said, uh, if any assets are long-term, then pension assets. So I've never understood why, 
why why pension funds are not allowed to be basically I'll say all in in, in equities because it's it's long term money. Uh, and then again in the um, in the third pillar, voluntary pension savings, uh, i.e. this PS long term account that I mentioned, that's actually uh, pretty relaxed in the sense that within that system you're allowed to I mean, the citizen is allowed to decide fully by themselves exactly how that money is invested up to actually directly into equities. So, uh, and that's how it should be, I would say. Uh, there needs to be some trust, I, I would say, on the kind of individual citizen knowing, knowing what to do uh, uh, with their pensions. But I, I, I do realize that I might, be, I might not represent the majority with this view. <laughs> But then, historically, I mean, as long as you have a whatever investment cycle of more than 20 years, historically, you've always been okay with equities. So, uh, so as such, why would that continue? Okay. So, if we if we take a, a broader view, um, we'll have um, the ability to um, to have various market participants to market the PEP, the Pan European Pensions product. Uh, Mr. Dembrowski has mentioned the insurance providers, the investment fund managers, the private pension fund managers. Today, for example, in Latvia, the third uh, third pillar uh, can only be um, marketed and and, and, go, and uh, issued on the market uh, only by the uh, by the pension uh, pension funds. Um, uh, so then uh, we'll have the scale effect. Um, understanding the scale that we're operating here in the market uh, means that uh, anyone looking for uh, more aggressive um, options, also understanding the limits we have here, will go uh, to uh, potentially a plan that's offered by, by another provider who's operating in a, in a more liberal market. And uh, we also don't have the life cycle uh, provisions in place. So, And at the same time, the way, and it's a nice way, the discussion at the EU level is now set up that the EU is essentially providing the blueprint of the best approaches, as, as Pep uh, describes. And it's to the national level to decide whether this is then mimicked in all the other products that are offered here in the market. So one option would be that Lithuania and Latvia nationally don't really move very fast and it's the bigger providers and bigger markets uh, who've already accumulated larger pots of money able to invest uh, directly in various options and therefore returning better yield that they, they win the game. What's your take, uh, take on this? And, uh, um, how not to end up in, in that situation and whether there is a risk of that. So if I understood you correctly, so you are asking uh, what's going to happen with Latvian or Lithuanian market when we will have open uh, but, uh, market. So I think it will be uh, uh, two impacts. Uh, of course, uh, I, I don't believe that uh, everybody would rush uh, here from asset, management, asset managers uh, into Lithuanian or Latvian uh, markets uh, uh, to compete here for limited uh, resources, I mean for clients and, and for assets. Uh, but for those persons who are uh, specifically seeking uh, for, for the product, so I, I hope that would be uh, much easier to do that now uh, or later. Uh, but uh, we have uh, another side, uh, we have uh, local asset managers uh, who, com uh, who could compete uh, in, in the broader market. Uh, and I'm proud that, uh, as also Mr. Husman men mentioned, uh, Swedish uh, pension system, so uh, INBL uh, has its mutual funds that is uh, available for Swedish pension uh, pensioners, uh, future pensioners, and they actually are putting money into those funds. So uh, we as a company are competing in that market. So if after those uh, regulation uh, implementations uh, that would be easier to do that, so uh, we would be really glad. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, not, not just uh, our company but, uh, but also uh, Latvian asset managers could, could compete uh, into a broader market. In the regulation I didn't see any word about the anti-money laundering of the KYC, know your customer aspect, and, and these are quite differently regulated in different countries. And there might be that some countries are in more favored uh, status and the others are not in so favored status. If you have to really know your customer, how can you uh, do it cross-border via online with somebody in the other uh, member state? 
So I think, um, at least in Latvia, we have to think about uh, how to be more competitive if we want to go outside of our uh, borders. Mr. Wissman, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, I can't speak much for the providers of, of these products, uh, but uh, I certainly, I mean, if I broaden it a little bit and, and also address the kind of uh, where these assets are invested, uh, there I see a kind of a, let's put it, let's be optimistic for a while. So uh, there I see an opportunity for the kind of local markets, I mean, uh, to, to, to with, with being proactive to actually get a, get a bigger share of the kind of assets that hopefully start accumulating into the pet product. Because obviously if, uh, if nothing is done, then I think uh, very likely the assets will very much be invested based on the kind of global, global allocations and, and obviously the share of, say, Latvia out of that is not going to be much. So, so there I would see a kind of an extra incentive for the kind of member states to be active in, in thinking about ways to, to improve the, the local capital markets. And of course, I, I have to say this, uh, I mean, one, one example of what should be done as I see it, and which in Finland is to some degree behind the, the situation today where we have, I think the last 50 years we've had the best returns globally from the Helsinki exchange when it comes to assets. And that is the kind of the listing of state-owned companies. I mean, <laughs> today looking at the Finnish market, we have a lot of originally state-owned companies that were listed back in the day. We, we, we still see some of that happening. Just last year we saw the, uh, the state-owned uh, alcohol company. They, they listed successfully uh, on NASDAQ uh, about 20,000 uh, Finnish investors actually joined that IPO. So certainly that would be one, one, one tangible measure locally to, to make sure that some of these assets are then actually invested <coughs> locally and thereby you know, contributing to, to, to uh, job creation and, uh, and, and overall economic growth. So, uh, so that to me would be a, in a way a low-hanging fruit, even though I understand it's <laughs> politically sensitive. Yeah, maybe uh, just to come in on uh, a couple of aspects. Uh, first, on this um, uh, online applications and IML uh, considerations. Uh, I'm uh, sometimes uh, puzzled about this discussion. I remember we had this discussion also in the European uh, Commission, and uh, I was also pushing actually to make sure that in anti-money laundering directive, online submission of documents is not considered higher risk than uh, submitted them uh, in uh, person. Uh, uh, for whatever reasons it was put in in the, some original uh, drafts and uh, it's, uh, sorry to say, uh, puzzling. If you come in with clay plugs or, as the best case, dead trees, then it's really safe. If you submit everything online with electronic uh, signature, then it's somehow less uh, safe. So uh, there, uh, I think we can uh, uh, discuss this aspect, but uh, philosophically, what exactly you don't know from electronic documents, uh, from what you do know from clay plaques, so to say. Um, not, uh, no, not very clear. And another aspect which I think is um, uh, very uh, important is this uh, tax aspect. Uh, if we talk cross-border provision, uh, competition across the EU, uh, it's uh, uh, incentives, tax incentives which member states are providing and that's why it's so important that member states are actually following up on the Commission's recommendation that member states provide the same tax incentives as they provide for national uh, uh, pension funds, pension products, uh, also to uh, PEPs, even though if uh, all the design uh, features are not exactly uh, there, we allowed some flexibility on what is uh, PEP without predefining it too strictly, and one reason was exactly to allow some scope to adjust PEP more to the uh, national tax incentives, but also we need some flexibility for, uh, uh, from member states for uh, PEP to be uh, successful. So. Um, we're also happy to take any questions from the audience. Uh, you can just stand up and, and talk. We'll uh, repeat the question in the in, in the mic. So, any 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 interested? Or we'll do another quick round here, and then if any any questions, we'll, we'll come back. You give people freedom, and you incentivize them, and you see the result. Um, I don't see this doing either of those. 
because the fact of the matter is, is that in Latvia, we have an example where we, we earlier had the ability to invest up to 10% of your income in, in life insurance policies, another 10% in, in third uh, level pensions. And somebody decided that no, no, that's far too much and people are taking advantage of the system and they limited it to 10% overall. And they wonder why people have, have no interest in this or don't really see a cause and effect element taking place in terms of their quality of life. Um, our pension funds have been too conservative. They've hardly beaten uh, inflation. And you wonder why people don't put more trust in this. What if we gave people the opportunity to choose their own way of saving money and incentivize, incentivize them up front with tax refund policies and give them choice? Because right now, you're not giving choice, you're restricting choice of movement as well. So even if you put money in this fund, what's going to happen, I know this already, is that the big banks, the, the, the big pension funds, will, will blow their marketing budget to get people locked in, and then they're locked in for five years. And then afterwards, they can put on different service charges and so forth and so forth. So you're not really helping individuals. And also, if these large funds compete in Latvia, it sucks money away from the possibility of Latvian capital markets developing. They won't be investing in small projects around the country. They'll be sending that money back and investing it in an index fund based out of Frankfurt or whatnot. So we're not benefiting as a country in terms of our savings going towards something that builds our country or that gets better returns. Because our managers haven't shown, or these managers will be included on this list, haven't shown that they can, they can create excellent returns. They just haven't. Give people a chance. When you tie the hands and, and feet that you ask to swim, it's rather hard. I mean, I think that the returns has been um, respected to where they has been invested in that sense. And, uh, well, and what's, what's that? Yeah. Latvian pension funds are charging two percent, and then investing that money in bank deposits, making half a percent. You are losing money off of that. It's not even the problem of, of, of oh, we don't have a restriction in terms of equity exposure. Even the fixed income exposure, they're making choices that by, by default are losing money for their for their clients. I mean, if you look at the uh, asset allocation, there is not so that all the money is in deposits and there was one, maybe one moment in the historical t timeline when it was uh, kind of uh, really profitable, that was, that was very small, short moment. I think that uh, if you look uh, decently on where the money is invested, it's of course very diversified. And I, I, uh, I kind of uh, support what you say is that uh, to large extent that money is invested in different indexes as well and different uh, different world while the, in instruments and the reason is that we also want to protect the uh, customer interest and uh, get the best uh, investment return and uh, pretty much well diversified. At the same time, I think that the pension funds are uh, by far the only ones supporting the local venture uh, venture capital market developments and also our proposals which we have submitted uh, supports very much uh, multi capital development, uh, particularly splitting uh, separately the investments in the real estate funds uh, from the real equity funds and separating the hedge funds in a separate limit because currently the limit which is allowed to invest, for example, in a local, uh, more or less local market, let's say, in the venture capital is, is, is very small, which basically means if any venture cap uh, capital firm would like to launch something here, they would have to get the, the approval from all the existing pension funds here uh, in order to build it up. So, uh, I mean, we, we also have to see here that some, some changes are needed in the legislation to, to make more flexibility here. But of course, uh, all customers are looking for a lower price, which means uh, in the future we also have to see that uh, all asset managers will be seeking uh, for any sort of opportunities, either be it uh, cheaper investments or, or, or uh, some more interesting alternatives that might give uh, better returns. Mm -hmm. And our proposals are aimed at uh, securing this option or possibility. So maybe we can also pick up on Mr. Rukas in terms of how this discussion is playing out in Lithuania and whether you've uh, proceeded further in opening up the alternative investment options for the uh, for the fund managers. Investments goes to uh, fixed income products or even deposits. Uh, so probably it's not completely true, especially if we are talking about the third pillar because it's uh, it's allowed to have uh, equity, pure equity funds. So that's not not a problem. And uh, the other comment about uh, also deposits. Uh, so it's uh, it's not proper way to uh, to take some part of the fund and say that look uh, this uh, this is a bad investment because we have to look at, at the whole portfolio. I just had a meeting with a with a client that's 50 in, in fantastic health. Uh, she runs a, a health-based business. She's going to live another 50 years. 
So if you're now investing according to some sort of life cycle plan and now, and now rotating into fixed income and making, well, in euro, you're making maybe 1% after fees, 2%. Like she's got another 50 years where money can grow. Are we accommodating for that? Yes, as far well as now in Estonia, there is a debate about leaving at least 30% in equity on the, on the pension age uh, because the life is not ending at the, at the pension age, of course, and there is, uh, in, a, in a best case, some at least 10, 20 years of, uh, of a rather healthy life. And, and of course, during that li lifetime, it's also quite important to earn some um, some more interest and, and not only the fixed the guaranteed level. So I completely agree with this uh, comment and that's also one of our thoughts that we we right now are taking care of the savings which is the most uh, accumulation period which is most crucial of course and we are building it up but uh, with every year we have to start thinking about what are the options for the out payment and, uh, and I think that's also a crucial, crucial part for a debate. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't really end like with zero in equity I guess. Okay. Probably. Okay. Very good. And I think on the on the fee cap, the discussion around the introduction of PEP, uh, whenever it comes down to the member states with a one percent fee, will probably be a guiding guiding debate also here for the private pension funds. Uh, and uh, with the debate on the second bill already passed us uh, over the last year. Um, any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to extend on Paul's note. Uh, basically. I guess what he, yeah, Arthur Smith is uh, I'm in the market. Uh, basically, I want to extend on the Paul's point that giving the freedom is important. As of last year, we introduced the individual uh, savings accounts in Latvia. So basically, I guess the idea is that introduce those accounts into the third pillar framework so that uh, the clients could choose the products what they want. So basically, I guess that, that's the point what he raised, especially today when we are like uh, having this technolog technological advancement. Uh, basically having robot wise having uh, ai uh, which is very uh, let's say uh, developed in united states europe is lagging behind so basically with that we could create uh, specifically uh, personalized solutions for the clients it's even better than life cycle so basically i guess that's the point which uh, Wells was trying to do very good so yeah an important point that last year during the tax reform the uh, the like of uh, the Swedish uh, investment account was uh, introduced in Latvia as well, uh, providing the opportunity as of um, 2019, right, to start uh, the saving. So it's very, very fresh. Uh, uh, we haven't yet even collected the statistics that uh, were how many such accounts have been created. Uh, but on the idea of combining this with, with the allowance, uh, further allowance under the third pillar, um, maybe comments from Christina? Yes, and I, I think that's like. also our idea on the Finance Latvia Association side, uh, that the PEP is giving a very good framework on the liberalization of the market, because we can put on the same line different products provided by the pension funds, asset managers, banks, uh, life insurance companies, and, and I completely agree that the bigger competition also creates a better options for a customer. Uh, however, we have to slightly remember the tax incentives, which are pretty much building up the savings market, and we have to pay also due account to that, uh, how it's regulated. And, and um, basically, it is uh, the, the aim of those incentives is to make the savings in the long term, in that sense that uh, they should be there for a decent uh, moment of the time saved and only then uh, benefited from there, but if, if those products are supporting that, and I, I think that that's um, just a matter of the construction of a product, then, then definitely the, the more products, the more options we have for a voluntary savings, the better. Any comments from Mr. Husman on this? How did you end up in the, in the place you ended up, as you said, during the keynote? Yeah, I mean, it's, this is a sensitive topic as well, and, uh, and uh, just couple of notes on what's been discussed now. Uh, first off, I mean, the kind of pension funds, how to get them to invest locally. I mean, in Finland we have uh, the, the second pillar system. It's pretty centralized. We only have, uh, what, uh, three major pension funds left. Uh, and, and they are kind of uh, uh, almost close to public, public publicly run enterprises. Uh, so it's, it is an issue for the local markets, I mean, the, say that the biggest of the funds, they have, I think, 50 billion euros now under, under assets under management. So obviously, for example, when discussing the kind of need to 
to find investors to invest in, in SME companies who, who do an IPO or NASDAQ. I mean, for this kind of, if you have 50 billion assets under management, your actual appetite to, to, to look into a company to raise 5 million euros, as an example, <laughs> might not really be there. But uh, at least in Finland, I think we've successfully um, managed to get these pension funds in a way uh, take responsibility for the local market as well. Because at the end of the day, I mean, the pension fund liabilities, they are very local. <laughs> so, so, I mean, the pension funds, just based on that, to me, they should actually have a bias towards <coughs> investing locally. Because if the, if the local market doesn't do well in terms of growth and employment, then the, the pension fund liabilities will be hit at least in the Finnish uh, second pillar system where the, where the kind of uh, whatever the term is, I mean, you, uh, you pay a certain amount, but then you're guaranteed a certain outcome when you retire. So, so in that system, at least the pension fund should have an appetite to actually favor the local investment culture. And in Finland so far, I would say it's been working pretty well. I mean, just looking at the last week, we've lately had about five to 10 SME IPOs a year in Finland. And, uh, and I dare claim that the second pillar pension funds, they've all taken a look at all of these. They haven't invested, of course, in all of them, because clearly we don't want a system where, where the local uh, pension funds, in a way, uh, have an impact on the valuations and all that. But, uh, but I would say we found a good balance. Uh, and then on the freedom of choice, absolutely. I mean, to me, it's... Uh, but then again, on that, I would just say that it's very much, as was mentioned already, it's, it's, it's tax-driven, of course, end of day. So, so again, when, when giving and determining exactly what kind of products against what kind of commitments receive uh, tax incentives, that's really the key point. Because easily tax incentives will then be, to some extent, they are visible in the kind of fees charged for the products. <laughs> uh, this is a blunt statement, but I, at least in the Finnish model, uh, you have certain tax incentives for certain insurance-related savings products, then that tends to show up in the kind of fee structure of the products as well. So absolutely, that's, again, for the member states to be very careful when, when assessing the kind of uh, tax incentives. And of course, it, it, it should be a level playing field. Of course, I understand that when incentivizing long-term savings, then of course, there should be a, some kind of a limitation on, on, for example, on how quickly do we, you can, you can uh, uh, utilize the funds. But say, for any product that fulfills that criteria, that if there's a lock up until you're 65, then obviously there, there, there should be freedom on uh, how to invest it and uh, what kind of products. And, and there I would say uh, the, the Finnish uh, the PS model, I think, was a, was a nice example. Though then again, where that failed was the, the, the fact that the, the government started to you know, change the, the, the rules in the middle of the game, so to say, which then uh, turned, turned people off because they just felt that uh, you know, there's, no, there's no guarantee on, on how the taxation will look like when I retire in 30 years' time. So, so most people just, you know, stop using it. So this would be... I'm listening about these tax incentives and uh, wondering uh, what are the initiatives for national states uh, to create uh, identical or similar, very comparable tax incentives, for example, in Latvia and in Germany. Uh, can the national state uh, expect that the funds from uh, that will be invested then ultimately also in Latvia, at least on a rather basis. What are these in incentives? Have you thought about it? Member states still can uh, have their own uh, incentives and the incentive structure, uh, as we have heard also from today's discussion, across member states uh, uh, differ how much member state wants uh, to uh, facilitate people investing in uh, third pillar uh, pensions. So what we are uh, saying uh, with uh, our uh, recommendation that uh, if there is a PEP uh, uh, product that it benefits uh, from the same incentives as national uh, pensions uh, products. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, what are the implications where uh, this product is exactly uh, invested? That's of course a valid uh, question, and uh, I, I think that member states will have to look into. 
uh, we are uh, mainly looking at more from a uh, uh, demand side. If we want uh, people to invest in certain pillar pensions, and as we uh, uh, were discussing, as I was telling also in a keynote speech, uh, that this will be very much needed to uh, at least partly uh, bridge the pensions gap which we are uh, facing. Uh, we need to facilitate this investment, and uh, especially in uh, the, um, uh, small markets, uh, uh, there's also uh, supply side uh, issue, how advantageous, uh, so to say, investment products, uh, uh, pension products are you can get in uh, national markets, and that's not always uh, very advantageous, so you basically uh, live with, uh, leave savers with more uh, options. Uh, uh, so what are the, this is exact cost-benefit analysis also from the angle you mentioned, uh, of course at the end of the day uh, will be uh, for member states to decide. Yep. So this one? Yeah, I mean, just to add to that, uh, as I understood your question, uh, it's, it's not feasible in the, uh, within the EU to actually have any kind of special treatment for uh, uh, any kind of special tax treatment for investments locally, so, so to your question. I mean, I, I, I believe that's not really kind of feasible, uh, so I just wanted to add that. When we were uh, preparing this uh, proposal, we paid uh, quite a lot of attention on uh, transparency. First of all, transparency on cost and fees. So, uh, investor uh, who is investing in this pension spread needs to know how much uh, he or she will be charged for that. Uh, I think that's uh, quite obvious. Uh, then, the second is that the structure of uh, pensions product has been uh, have how to be uh, relatively uh, simple, so that. Uh, uh, once again, investors can understand what they are investing in, and uh, as we were discussing, up to six uh, options which can be provided. Uh, and uh, also, pension providers need to produce a so called a key information document describing the main features and also the main risks uh, of the pension products people are uh, investing. So, uh, the, well, the, uh, the baseline for this is that uh, when uh, people are investing, and here we're talking mainly about retail investors, uh, it's important that they understand what they are investing, what are potential returns, what are potential risks, and how much they are charged with that. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, indeed. Uh, transparency, I think, is a very uh, key aspect um, in, in uh, savings products, and there is a, there has been done already a good job, and I think that uh, for a second pension pillar and for a private pension funds, the key documents in Latvia, at least already, is uh, is uh, giving some picture to the uh, to the customer of what they are buying and, and what are the risks and what are the fees. I think that uh, maybe the trips for insurance uh, sector is. is maybe not the best case and, and here it's a very interesting how at the end of the day the uh, PEP will regulate at all because currently um, for each uh, individual separate industry we have the separate regulation and uh, the, the document has to be formed specifically in these tables and this format and, and take whichever industry you want it's a, it's a separate kind of pattern so I really hope that the, the PEP will give some kind of a guidance how to unify that all because it's a uh, it's uh, not only complicated for a customer, but even for a provider uh, to, to follow up uh, all the different regulations in the different industries and, and different patterns there. So some unification would be would be needed here, and I hope that the PEP uh, will provide some insight into that as well. What, what unification will be on with the two? I think as well, yeah. With two is as well, yeah. And for you, for us, and it's very clear what these do. So how would this institute a higher level of, of, of governance over Yeah, if you are, for example, advocating MIFID 2, then I could show for uh, trips and, and somebody for no, no, writing MIFID In what ways it's, it's more transparent than MIFID 2? You said it was, you're on the panel, I presume you know in what ways it is, so I'm asking you to answer this. Answer what? In what ways would this, the PEP, be more transparent than MIFID 2 registration? So I think MIFID 2 is more, is more uh, appropriate for this because it's, it has to do with capital markets and how you, how you show what you do with capital markets. It's fine if it will be MIFID 2. Uh, it, it's fine, but what I'm referring to is that in each industry we have a separate regulation right now that we have to follow. Uh, accordingly to what we have to show to the customer, and the patterns are very different, and they are not transparent uh, always uh, for a customer. So, so, so you can't tell me how much more transparent it is or less than MIFID 2. That's it. Okay. 
uh, details are still to be clarified in the implementing regulations by the IOPA. And in that sense, uh, which way this will go uh, will, uh, will uh, of course, determine. And I think probably the worst outcome for all of us is that there is a third version of the key information document specific to this product. And uh, what we take from Mr. Miklasiewicz's uh, comment is that maybe uh, MIFID would be a good middle, middle ground. Uh, I think it's clear that at the level of the regulations, uh, the details of the key information document have not been spelled uh, out. That will happen still. Um, hopefully later this year, most likely next year, as IOPA works uh, works through. Okay, um, I've promised uh, Mr. Dubrovskis to uh, cut the panel at 11:45. Uh, we're at 11:43, so uh, with that, I would ask you to um, join me in a round of applause to the panel.